In the autumn of 2012, the mysterious disappearance of Tomas Seibold, a 32-year-old survivalist and outdoor instructor, unfolded in the remote wilderness of Alaska, leaving more questions than answers. Born on June 27, 1980, in Germany, Seibold was a seasoned outdoorsman. Standing six feet tall, weighing approximately 165 pounds, with green eyes, long auburn hair, and a distinctive mustache and beard. Seibold, who resided in Three Lakes, Wisconsin, was last seen alive between September 27th and 29th of 2012, at a fish camp cabin 30 miles north of Ambler, Alaska. His attire at the time of his disappearance remains unknown. In June of 2012, he embarked on a journey to explore Alaska's backcountry, planning to spend about five months in the wilderness. A skilled survivalist, Seibold had spent six years training and instructing at the Taking Drum Outdoor School, a center that teaches Native American values, weather forecasting, shelter building, and primitive hunting and gathering techniques. The school's founder, Tamarack Song, described Seibold as an experienced outdoorsman and a wandering spirit. Seibold was known for spending extended periods in the forest during winter, living in primitive structures, and surviving off handmade snare lines. In summer, he would stay out for a month at a time in the Wisconsin Northwoods. Seibold's journey in Alaska began at a native fish camp in the southern part of the state. He traveled north along the Nano River near Fairbanks, living off the land. By September of 2012, he reached the village of Ambler and then traveled 30 miles up the Ambler River to a cabin owned by the Schreibers, a family Tamarack had connected with him. The Schreibers had lived in this remote location for nearly 20 years, raising four sons. After staying with the Schreibers until September 27th of 2012, Seibold continued his journey into the gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve. He was expected to be back in touch by early November, with a flight scheduled for November 15th back to Wisconsin. However, something prevented him from following his plans to travel to the town of Kobuk to catch his flight. When Seibold missed his flight, Alaskan state police were alerted to his disappearance on November 11th of 2012. A search led by Sergeant Dwayne Stone began near the junction of the Ambler River where Seibold might have set up a base camp. The search faced severe weather conditions with temperatures dropping to minus 23 degrees Fahrenheit with short daylight hours. The area's remoteness and challenging terrain made the search operation difficult. After six flights over 13 days, the search was suspended on November 24th due to the plummeting temperatures. Family and friends resumed the search, hiring bush pilots and covering 3,500 square miles, but to no avail. Clues such as a missing map section, a book describing traditional Eskimo routes, and Tomas's interest in rafting down the Ambler River provided some insight, but no concrete answers. Seibold's disappearance remains a mystery. He was declared legally deceased in 2013, although no remains have ever been found. This case highlights the unpredictability and dangers of the wilderness, even for experienced individuals like Seibold. His story serves as a reminder of the importance of safety measures, such as carrying a personal locator beacon when venturing into remote areas. As of August 2023, there have been no further updates on this case. Samantha Sayers, a woman whose spirit and love for the great outdoors have left an indelible mark. Known to her friends as Sam, she's a figure of strength and inspiration. In her teenage years, Sam faced a challenge that would test anyone's resolve, alopecia, an autoimmune condition that resulted in the loss of all her hair. But Sam, with her unbreakable spirit, embraced her baldness with pride, becoming a beacon of confidence and charm among her peers. Sam's passion for nature was kindled during her studies at the State University of New York, where she pursued a master's in technical theater design and technology. Post-graduation, she moved to Seattle, a city known for its stunning natural landscapes. It was here that Sam's life took a romantic turn when she met Kevin Dares, a single father of three, through Tinder. Their shared love for the wilderness saw them exploring Seattle's majestic peaks and mountains, creating memories in the lap of nature. However, 
In August of 2018, a solo hike on a familiar trail turned into a profound mystery. Sam set out to conquer the Vesper Peak Trail in the North Cascades National Park, a challenging route not meant for the faint-hearted. She planned a day-long hike, assuring Kevin she'd be back by dusk. But as night fell, Sam didn't return, setting off a chain of events that would lead to one of the most baffling missing person cases in recent American history. Despite an extensive search involving volunteers, law enforcement, and even infrared-equipped helicopters, no trace of Sam was found. The only clues to her presence in the park were her car in the parking lot and her signature on a trail log. The search lasted 22 days and ended with more questions than answers. Theories about Sam's disappearance abound, from a tragic accident in the treacherous park to more sinister possibilities, possibly involving foul play. Her mother, Lisa, suspects that there is more to the story than meets the eye. Sam, described as a white female with a distinctive bald head, green eyes, and stars on a vine tattoo across her head, was last seen in a green sports bra and gray hiking pants. This story isn't just a tale of a missing person. It's a narrative about a woman whose love for nature and indomitable spirit continue to inspire. If you have any information about Samantha Claire Sayers, please reach out to Detective Kendra Connolly of the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office. Let's keep the spirit of adventure and hope alive as we seek answers in this mysterious case. Vernon Cody Matthews, at 23 years old, was not just an anthropology student at the University of California, Berkeley. He was a young man with a profound passion for the past. Known affectionately as Cody, his fascination with dinosaurs and archaeology often led him to participate in digs, earning him the playful nickname Indiana Jones from his parents. His love for anthropology, archaeology, and geology was deep-rooted, and he was equally skilled in survival techniques, making him an experienced outdoorsman in his early 20s. This background makes the circumstances of his disappearance in the wilderness deeply perplexing, leaving his family and friends in a state of ongoing bewilderment. In early June of 2014, Cody embarked on a journey from his university dorm to Pollock Pines, California, situated near the majestic Sierra Nevada Mountains. The Matthews family owned a cabin in this serene location, and Cody's parents, Vern and Cindy, planned to join him a few days later. This arrangement was perfect for Cody, who relished the opportunity to connect with nature, living off the land, and exploring the dense forests surrounding the cabin. However, on June 6, Cindy received a phone call from Cody that would mark the beginning of a mysterious and unsettling series of events. Instead of sharing exciting tales of his time at the cabin, Cody relayed the alarming news that the cabin had been ransacked. The thieves had made off with jewelry, cameras, and tools, amounting to a loss of between $13,000 and $18,000. Vern and Cindy were understandably shaken by this news and quickly made plans to head to the cabin the following day. Before ending the call, Cindy and Cody discussed his plans for the afternoon, during which Cody mentioned he was going for a hike. Little did they know, this conversation would be their last. Upon arriving at the cabin, Vern and Cindy were met with a series of bizarre clues. A heavy saw, requiring at least two people to move, was inexplicably placed in the driveway, a kettle was left on the stove, and an unfinished plate of eggs sat in the kitchen. Their calls for Cody echoed unanswered, and a wave of panic set in. They scoured every inch of the cabin, only to find that the security and animal cameras installed for protection had been completely destroyed, and there was evidence of forced entry through the cabin's side door. With no sign of Cody, and after countless failed attempts to reach him on his cell phone, his parents contacted the El Dorado County Sheriff's Department. The authorities, along with Cody's parents, deduced that he had left for his hike with just a few essentials, a bottle of water, a hunting blade, a compass, his phone, and a bag of trail mix. The last signal from his phone was traced to 6.30pm on June 6th near the South Fork of the American River. 
The newspaper reported that the ping showed Cody moving towards the house before ending in the water. An extensive search operation was launched, involving volunteers, law enforcement officials, dog teams, divers, and helicopters. They meticulously combed the Pollock Pines area and the banks of the American River, but no trace of Cody was ever found. After eight days of relentless searching, the operation was called off, leaving more questions than answers. The Matthews family, haunted by the possibility of foul play, speculated that the cabin burglary might be connected to Cody's disappearance. However, investigators have not established a definitive link between the two incidents. The family's grief was compounded in September of 2014 when a wildfire, later determined to be arson, ravaged Pollock Pines and destroyed the Matthews family cabin. The connection between this act of arson and Cody's disappearance remains speculative adding another layer of mystery to the already baffling case. Years have passed since Cody's disappearance, but Vern and Cindy Matthews continue to honor their son's memory and hold onto hope for answers. Vernon Cody Matthews is described as a white male with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a full reddish colored beard, standing six foot three inches tall and weighing 220 pounds. He was last seen wearing shorts, no t-shirt, and barefoot style shoes. Anyone with information that could shed light on this enduring mystery is urged to come forward. Cody's story is not just a missing persons case, it's a narrative that resonates with all who cherish the wilderness and the mysteries that it holds. In the tranquil town of Appleton, Wisconsin, the disappearance of 22-year-old Nicholas Hibdas has left both his family and investigators grappling with unanswered questions. Nicholas, a young man with a profound connection to the wilderness, often spent his weekends hiking and exploring the natural world with his faithful companion, a white German shepherd named Samantha. So when Nicholas vanished without a trace from his home in Appleton, the community was left in a state of shock and disbelief. The last confirmed sighting of Nicholas and Samantha was on April 1, 2019, at his residence. The details surrounding his disappearance, including his last known activities or the circumstances leading up to his vanishing, remained shrouded in mystery. Alarm bells rang when Nicholas failed to show up for work and lost contact with his family, prompting them to report him missing. Despite the gravity of his disappearance, the incident received surprisingly sparse news coverage, leaving many questions unanswered and the community in a state of unease. In response, Nicholas's family, friends, and the Appleton Police Department launched a search. The streets of Appleton were covered with missing person poster flyers, and the Appleton Police Department made a public appeal for any information that could lead to Nicholas. For 18 days, Nicholas's family endured an agonizing wait for news. Then, on April 18, 2019, the Appleton Police Department encountered their first and only significant lead. Nicholas's 2012 black Ford Fusion was found abandoned in a remote area near Highway 64 and Shadow Lake Road, across from the dense, sprawling National Forest. This area, known for its thick brush and dense vegetation, seemed an unlikely place for Nicholas to have traveled without a specific purpose. Adding to the mystery, there was no sign of Nicholas or Samantha near the car. Intriguingly, Samantha's collar appeared to have been deliberately removed, suggesting a possible struggle or an intentional act. About a mile from where the vehicle was found, investigators discovered a tarp and some gear. This discovery led to a massive search operation involving scent dogs, drones, and search and rescue personnel, but all efforts to find Nicholas or any further clues proved fruitless. By 2020, the Appleton Police Department had informed the local newspaper that the case had gone cold with no new leads or developments. The mystery of Nicholas's disappearance remains unsolved, leaving a void in the hearts of those who knew him. Nicholas is described as a white male with brown hair and eyes, standing between 5 foot 10 and 6 feet tall, weighing between 170 and 190 pounds. 
He has a distinctive tattoo of two squiggly uppercase Ys on his left wrist and was last seen wearing a black Gucci sweatshirt, blue American Eagle jeans, and brown or mustard color steel-toed work boots. The story is not just about a missing person. It's a narrative that resonates with all who cherish the wilderness and the mysteries that it holds. Anyone with information that could shed light on this enduring mystery is urged to contact investigator Chad Riddle of the Appleton Police Department. Nicholas's story continues to be a reminder of the unpredictable nature of life and the enduring hope for answers. It's a tale that speaks to the heart of every adventurer, every nature lover, and everyone who believes in the power of community in the face of the unknown. Michael Fisery, a 51-year-old from Southern California, epitomized the spirit of an off-the-grid adventurer. Adopted into the Fisery family along with his sister, Michael quickly embraced a life that intertwined with the great outdoors. His family fondly recalled his exceptional memory, particularly for hiking trails and paths, a skill that makes the circumstances of his disappearance in 2005 all the more baffling and heart-wrenching. On June 15th of 2005, Michael embarked on what was supposed to be a routine solo hike in Yosemite National Park, entering through the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. His initial plan was to hike through a series of scenic points, including Rancheria Falls, Tiltill Mountain, Lake Vernon, and Beehive, before completing the loop back to the reservoir. However, in a last-minute decision that would later puzzle everyone, Michael chose to trek along the Pacific Crest Trail towards Tiltill Mountain instead. Fellow hikers on the Pacific Crest Trail reported spotting Michael on his way to Tiltill Mountain. These sightings would later be marked as the last confirmed instances of anyone seeing or hearing from him. The alarm was raised on June 19th when Michael had still not returned from what was intended to be a short hike. His family, familiar with his tendency to overestimate his hiking distances, initially hoped that there was a simple explanation for his absence. They recalled a previous incident in Yellowstone National Park where Michael had severely injured his ankle and had to painstakingly crawl out of the trail until he was rescued. As concern mounted by June 21, 2005, Michael's family reached out to the Yosemite National Park Rangers to report him missing. This triggered a comprehensive search operation. Teams of search and rescue workers, along with volunteers, meticulously scoured the Pacific Crest Trail and the surrounding areas of the park. Near Tiltill Mountain, a particularly rugged and remote part of the park, searchers discovered Michael's backpack. The backpack contained a topographical map, a water bottle, and a camera, but there was no sign of Michael himself. His car was later found parked in the Hetch Hetchy parking area, adding another layer of mystery to his disappearance. Despite extensive searches by land and air, including the deployment of scent dogs, no further trace of Michael was ever found. The absence of clues has led his family to fear the worst, that Michael might have encountered foul play or suffered an injury off the beaten path, leaving him unable to seek help. In the years following his disappearance, Michael's sister has become a fervent advocate for hiker safety. She dedicates her time to educating hikers about the risks of solo trekking and the critical importance of being adequately prepared for every hike. She also volunteers to assemble hiking backpacks, ensuring that they are equipped with essential supplies suitable for various terrains and weather conditions, a tribute to her brother's legacy. Michael Fisery is described as a white male with gray hair and green eyes. He stands between 5 foot 8 and 5 foot 10 and weighs between 150 to 165 pounds. At the time of his disappearance, he was last seen wearing a faded blue or gray t-shirt with the sleeves ripped off, olive green or khaki colored shorts, and a torn pink or red scarf. Notably, he was not carrying adequate supplies for an extended hike, and he also had a beard and mustache. This story resonates deeply with those who share a passion for the wilderness and the mysteries that it holds. Anyone with information about Michael's disappearance is encouraged to contact Yosemite Park officials. In the winter of 2018, 
Konstantinos Danny Philippides, a 49-year-old firefighter from Toronto, embarked on what was supposed to be a routine annual ski trip with fellow off-duty and retired firefighters. Their destination was Whiteface Mountain in Wilmington, New York, a popular ski resort known for its challenging trails and picturesque views of the Adirondack Mountains. Philippides, an intermediate skier, was among a group of nine who looked forward to enjoying the slopes. On February 7th, their last day at the resort, the group planned to wrap up their trip and head home. However, Philippides, feeling enthusiastic, decided to take one final solo run down the mountain in the afternoon. His friends, tired from the day's activities, chose to wait for him at the lodge, located midway down the mountain. As Philippides ventured out, a severe snowstorm began, significantly reducing visibility and transforming the skiing conditions. When Philippides did not return by 4 p.m., the ski lift ceased operation. His friends grew increasingly worried. After waiting an additional 30 minutes, they reported him missing. The discovery that Philippides' personal belongings, including his car, passport, phone, and ID, were left untouched at their accommodations, this intensified concerns for his safety. A massive search operation was launched involving forest rangers, ski patrol, New York State Police, Homeland Security officers, U.S. border officials, and over 100 Toronto firefighters who traveled to assist in the search. Despite the use of helicopters, drones, and sniffer dogs, Philippides remained missing as weather conditions worsened. Six days later, in a stunning turn of events, Philippides was found over 4,500 kilometers away at the Sacramento airport in California. He was in a disoriented state, still wearing his ski clothes, including his green ski jacket, black helmet, and goggles, and also carrying his ski helmet. He had a new iPhone, a credit card, $1,000 in cash, and had recently gotten a haircut. Philippides had no clear memory of how he traveled from New York to California. He vaguely recalled riding in the back of a big rig truck and sleeping a lot during the journey. He wasn't able to recall purchasing the new phone or how he ended up at the airport. After being located, Philippides was questioned by law enforcement but showed no signs of drug or alcohol influence. He speculated that he might have suffered a head injury leading to his confused state. He was taken to a hospital, but was discharged without any sign of physical injuries. The circumstances of his disappearance and journey to California remain largely unexplained. Philippides himself later suggested that he might have taken a wrong turn after separating from his friends, leading to a fall near a children's ski slope. He believed he had hailed a truck for a ride back to town, but could not provide details about the driver or the truck. Philippides' experience raised several medical theories. Dr. Charles Tater, a brain surgeon, suggested that Philippides might have suffered from retrograde amnesia due to a concussion. Dr. Jennifer Ryan proposed that he might have experienced a disassociative state, a rare condition triggered by trauma or emotional disturbance, leading to a temporary loss of personal identity and impulsive wandering. Despite extensive investigations and medical consultations, the full story of Philippides' disappearance and journey remains shrouded in mystery. His memory loss and the lack of clear evidence have left many questions unanswered. The incident continues to intrigue and baffle experts and the public alike, with the true nature of what happened to Philippides during those six days in February of 2018 remaining a profound mystery. Thank you for watching until the end of this video, and if you've enjoyed this content, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my new and upcoming content. Today, we plunge into the enigmatic story of James Griffin, a tale nestled in the wilds of Washington State, a narrative that beckons to all lovers of nature, hiking, and the great outdoors. James Griffin, at the age of 60, was an inhabitant of Port Angeles, Washington. Those who knew him would describe him as a devoted individual. 
His heart echoed with the rhythm of the trails, and hiking was his solace. But fate threw a curveball when James, a laborer by profession, met with an injury to his foot. Yet, his spirit remained undaunted. Originally hailing from Michigan, James found a newfound love for the Washington State terrain. The magnificent Port Angeles isn't just a picturesque town, but it's also the gateway to the enchanting Olympic National Park. For those unfamiliar, let me paint a picture. The Olympic National Park is nature's masterpiece, a land where meticulously maintained trails stretch out, some even paved to perfection, leading explorers to mesmerizing destinations. Amongst the many wonders of the park, James had a particular fondness for its therapeutic hot springs. With his injured foot, these springs were more than just a natural wonder, they were his sanctuary. He would often find solace by soaking his feet letting the warmth ease his pain. As winter cast its frosty veil on December 22, 2014, James sought the comforting embrace of the springs. Despite the chill, he intended to make a brief visit, absorb the tranquility, and then return home. While the park did offer camping spots, it required prior reservations and paperwork. But on this day, James had a simple day-long hike planned. That fateful morning, he texted a friend, hinting at his beloved destination. His friend, knowing James's love for the springs, wished him an enjoyable trip. By around 10 a.m., James, in his Subaru Outback, was en route to Olympic National Park, a place where he proudly held an annual pass. And so, with a heart full of adventure, James set forth towards the trailhead, completely unaware of the mystery that awaited him. Now, let's delve deeper and uncover the enigma of James Griffin's journey. The specific trail stands out for its meticulous upkeep. For the most part, it's impeccably paved, providing clear passage, even across challenging terrains. It's not one of those ambiguous paths where one wrong turn could leave you disoriented. This trail is undeniably prominent, ensuring even the novice hiker won't lose their way. Reports suggest that James embarked on this trail around 10 in the morning. However, as time went on, the tone of our story shifts. Christmas Eve arrived, a time of merriment and gatherings. James was expected at a festive dinner, yet, as the clock ticked, James was nowhere to be found. Concern gripped his family when Christmas morning dawned and there was still no word from him. Arriving at James's residence, they found his dog seemingly distressed, having been left alone for an unsettling number of days. This was completely out of character for James. Concern quickly spiraled into panic. Following discussions with James's acquaintance, including the friend he had last texted, the family deduced that his last known location was the Olympic National Park. They promptly alerted local law enforcement about his mysterious disappearance on that fateful Christmas day in 2014. Local authorities collaborated with the Park Service, bringing them up to speed about the missing James Griffin. It was presumed that he might have ventured towards the Hot Springs, a place he often frequented. And, in a serendipitous twist, one park ranger, recalling the description of James's vehicle, remembered spotting a similar one stationed at the trailhead parking lot leading to the hot springs. The pieces of the puzzle started to come together, but the heart of the mystery remained. Upon arrival at the park's trailhead, investigators were met with an eerie sight. James's vehicle remained stationary, untouched since his journey began. A search of the car yielded a seemingly ordinary receipt from Safeway, dated December 22nd, time stamped at 10.20 a.m. It recorded James's purchase of Folger's instant coffee and, curiously, a Tootsie Roll. While seemingly mundane, these items painted a vivid picture of the beginning of James's fateful hike. Eagerly, the search team pressed on. Their voices echoed off the surrounding voyage as they called out for James, hoping for any sign of him. The trail remained as prominent and clear as always, but James was nowhere to be found. However, an intriguing breakthrough awaited. After a thorough review of surveillance footage, they identified vehicles that had been parked concurrently with James's. One such vehicle belonged to a couple who recounted a fateful encounter with James at the Hot Springs. They recalled he was in high spirits, sharing beverages with them. The couple noted seeing him later preparing to head back down the trail, backpack in tow. The trail, a mere two-mile trek, with its gentle slope leading back to the parking area, shouldn't have posed a challenge. But as the rangers retraced his steps, a chilling discovery awaited. About a half mile from the parking area, near a creek off the trail, they found James's backpack. 
Concealed with a towel and propped against a log, its contents seemed untouched. A can of Coca-Cola, a cup, and even a cigarette butt of James's preferred brand. Strangely, they also found a mountain meal, a prepackaged survival food, untouched, despite the stove and fuel found in his backpack. Intriguingly, a camera nestled within his belongings provided an additional layer of mystery. The film, once developed, showcased scenic shots typical of a nature lover. However, the last two shots deviated from this pattern. Instead of the meticulously framed beauty one might expect, they seemed almost random. One showcased dense shadow foliage across the creek, the other a boulder-strewn stretch of the creek. What was James trying to capture? And then there's the creek, on the other side of where James's belongings were found. The terrain becomes incredibly steep. This region of Olympic National Park is synonymous with relentless rain, making the territory not just challenging, but potentially treacherous. So, with these new details in hand, the quest to unravel the mystery of James's disappearance continues. What might have been a routine hike in one of the world's rainiest regions turned into a perplexing enigma. This backdrop set the scene for a confounding search. Upon finding James's backpack with no trace of James himself, the authorities ramped up their efforts, even getting James's family involved. They introduced James's dog, known for its close bond with him, to the site, hoping it would lead them to him. The attempt, however, was futile. Undeterred, park rangers deployed three separate canine teams in the subsequent weeks. Despite the expansive search, they found no trace of James. The relentless rain, characteristic of the area, coupled with the ensuing dense fog, hampered the efforts considerably, leading to a scaled-down search. Only six personnel, paired with three canine units, continued to search for James. Surprisingly, about a month after his disappearance, on January 25th, one team made an unexpected discovery. On a steep incline opposite the creek, considered improbable terrain for James due to his known foot injury, they found a Tootsie Roll wrapper. James's recent purchase receipt corroborated this find. Further up, a devastating discovery awaited. James's body lying near a log. Bizarrely, there were no injury marks or signs of trauma, and he seemed to be fully dressed. After a forensic examination, the results only deepened the mystery. The coroner identified the cause of death as hypothermia, labeling it accidental. This verdict raised many questions. Why would James, equipped with a coat and seemingly prepared for the cold, sit by a creek if he felt hypothermic? Why would he cross the creek and ascend 1,700 feet on a challenging incline, despite a debilitating foot injury? Furthermore, the earlier involvement of canine units failed to detect any scent of James. Only by sheer chance did the team decide to explore uphill. And even then, the dogs only acknowledged the presence of a body when virtually on top of him. The circumstances of James's final moments, from the inexplicably missent to his mysterious uphill journey and Tootsie Roll wrapper, leave us with more questions than answers. Olympic National Park boasts lush, dense greenery, a backdrop to James's puzzling tale. Imagine a man positioned to prepare a meal by the creek, only to traverse it and then journey uphill, seemingly just to eat a Tootsie Roll. One might wonder if it was even James who consumed the candy, or perhaps someone or something else. Oddly, the coroner's report adds another layer of mystery. The documented time of death is January 25th, the very day James was discovered, despite him being missing for 30 days. In such conditions, one would expect some level of decomposition, but surprisingly, James's body seemed unaffected. Furthermore, tests revealed no trace of drugs or alcohol in his system. The situation seems inexplicable. A man on disability decides to venture half a mile from his vehicle, sets out to make a meal, and then is possibly interrupted. What could have prompted such a man to cross a creek and ascend steep, rugged terrain, only to meet his end from hypothermia next to a log, apparently an entire month later? It's a perplexing case. The official report states James's death was accidental, caused by hypothermia. The theory suggests James deviated from the well-maintained path, consumed a Tootsie Roll, and then ascended further and met his fate a month after his disappearance. The narrative is baffling, and I'm eager to know what others think. Could James have been coerced uphill by an external entity or force? And if so, why does his body show no evidence of distress or trauma? And where was he for the duration of those missing 30 days? I'd appreciate insights and theories, as this case leaves me with more questions and answers. Share your thoughts in the comments below. 
Andrew Bliss, a 23-year-old man, was a familiar figure in the small, tight-knit community of Pulaski, New York. With his tall stature of six foot two and his brown hair and eyes, it made him quite recognizable. His life in Pulaski was unremarkable until the events of June of 2003, which set in motion a series of events that would lead to his mysterious disappearance. Bliss's life seemed to unravel when he abruptly quit his job following a painful breakup. The breakup had hit him hard, leaving friends and family concerned about his well-being. It was this concern that escalated when Bliss suddenly left town in his gray 2001 Chevy Impala without a word to anyone. His departure was so sudden that when he became unreachable, panic set in among those who knew him. On June 23rd, with heavy hearts and a sense of foreboding, his loved ones filed a missing persons report with the New York State Police. The plot thickened when three days before the missing persons report was filed, a call came in to the Sawyer County Sheriff's Department in northern Wisconsin. An abandoned vehicle had been spotted parked on the secluded Federal Forest Road 162, a remote area two miles north of State Highway 70. The vehicle, a gray 2001 Chevy Impala with New York license plates, was registered to Andrew Robert Bliss. The scene at which Bliss's car was found was eerie and puzzling. The vehicle was deserted, its doors left open as if inviting an unseen presence. The keys were still in the ignition, the gas tank was completely empty. Despite a thorough examination, no clues were found in or around the car. This lack of evidence was confounding, but what added to the mystery were reports from locals who claimed to have seen Bliss. They described him as walking along the road, smiling and waving at passerbys around 8 a.m., not far from where his car was found. A particularly chilling account came from the driver of a logging truck who claimed to have seen Bliss walking that morning. According to the driver, Bliss was dressed in a long sleeve shirt and pants and he turned to wave. This fleeting interaction is the last confirmed sighting of Bliss. Realizing the gravity of the situation, the Sawyer County authorities launched an extensive search and rescue operation. The area along Federal Forest Road 162, where Bliss's car was found, is known for its challenging terrain, a densely wooded forest with swamps. The search party included the Sawyer County Sheriff's Department, the Fire Association, two planes from the Civil Air Patrol, and three canine units. They combed an eight-mile section of the National Forest for any sign of Bliss. The Sawyer County Gazette reported on the search, describing the area as desolate and swampy, a place where few would wander by choice. Despite the exhaustive efforts, the search yielded nothing. The search teams also checked nearby cabins and any place Bliss could have sought refuge, but they found nothing out of the ordinary. Further investigation into Bliss's past revealed that this wasn't the first time he had run out of gas. On two other occasions during his cross-country journey, he had made contact with law enforcement for the same reason. Since his cell phone was not found in the car, it was assumed he had it with him when he disappeared. Yet, why he drove to such a remote area in rural Wisconsin and why he didn't call for help remains shrouded in mystery. The local community was not ready to give up. In response to Bliss's shocking disappearance, they formed a Sawyer County search and rescue team. This dedicated group, composed of adult and youth volunteers, underwent extensive training in tracking, clue awareness, navigation, first aid, and other essential search and rescue skills. They resumed the search for Bliss, even using the opportunity to train new members. During another thorough search of the eight-mile section of the forest where Bliss vanished, the team encountered what they hoped would be a significant breakthrough. Cadaver dogs, part of the search team, alerted their handlers to the presence of what they believed to be human remains in a specific area. With each volunteer spaced out every 10 feet, the team meticulously sifted through the underbrush, hoping to discover any sign of Andrew Bliss. Eventually, they stumbled upon a bone at the base of a tree, hidden beneath a pile of leaves. The discovery reignited interest in the case, with local media speculating that this could be the key to unraveling the mystery of what happened to Bliss. 
The search and rescue team promptly set the bone to a forensic anthropologist for analysis, leaving the Stoyer County community in suspense for days. The anticipation turned into disappointment when the results returned. The bone, initially thought to be a human tibia, was identified as that of a bear, which bears a resemblance to human bones. With no further leads to pursue, the search for Andrew Bliss hit a dead end. Despite the lack of evidence, the outdoors men and women of Sawyer County remained vigilant. In 2011, the Sawyer County Sheriff's Office began asking deer hunters to keep an eye out for any clues that might emerge in the wilderness. Pat Sanchez, the Sawyer County Emergency Management Director, expressed the community's determination to the press, stating, We want to bring closure for his family, and we believe someone may have seen something or stumbled across something. Clothing, glasses, bone fragments, something. Anything found in that area could be relevant to this case. The call to action was clear. If anybody had information, even if it seemed remotely connected to the case, they were urged to contact the Sawyer County Sheriff's Department. The hope is that one day, some piece of evidence will surface that will help solve the disappearance of Andrew Bliss, providing much needed closure to a family and community haunted by this unexplained vanishing. In the expanse of Virginia's Shenandoah National Park, a perplexing disappearance unfolded, weaving a narrative that would perplex and sadden many. Ty Sawyer, an 18-year-old with a life ahead of him, became the subject of a massive search operation after he inexplicably disappeared into the dense forest on the night of April 22, 2021. This was not merely a case of a young man losing his way. It was a tale of sudden and unexplained psychological turmoil, a family's frantic quest for answers, and a search that would end in heartbreak. Ty's life took a bewildering turn in the days preceding his disappearance. His mother, Chandra Maxwell, recounted the onset of Ty's disturbing behavior, marked by hallucinations that shattered the mundane reality of his life. He was a shelf stalker by day, but his nights became haunted by bizarre delusions. He once sent a text to his mother, inquiring why she had dispatched aliens to surveil him at work. He also believed he was conversing with his late grandfather, a claim that was as distressing as it was mystifying. One morning, in a text exchange that would later haunt Chandra, she reminded Ty of track practice after school. His reply was unsettling. He claimed he was already at practice, a clear impossibility that signaled something was amiss. Ty's parents, Chandra and John Sawyer, were deeply troubled, suspecting that their son might be under the influence of an unknown substance. Their fears escalated when John discovered Ty in a state of unresponsiveness, sprawled in their living room, a cartoon flickering on television as if mocking the gravity of the situation. The arrival of paramedics was met with a sudden seizure that gripped Ty, a violent prelude to the chaos that would soon unfold. At the hospital, it took a team of eight to restrain him, a testament to the severity of his altered state. Despite a clean drug panel, the hospital inexplicably discharged Ty, leaving his parents in a state of desperation and confusion. Determined to protect Ty, Chandra and John faced an unforeseen challenge. Seizing a moment when Chandra was showering, he grabbed her car keys and fled. His attire was casual and ill-suited for the outdoors. A blue hoodie, blue pajamas, and white sneakers, the sneakers still sheathed in yellow hospital booties. Upon realizing her son had vanished, Chandra reached out to Ty. He claimed he had driven to a convenience store, but his failure to return home signaled a dire turn of events. Utilizing a tracking app, Chandra and John embarked on a harrowing chase, following Ty's erratic path through Philadelphia, Maryland, and nearly catching up with him near the White House in Washington, D.C. However, as they approached Luray, Virginia, Ty's cell signal vanished, and with it, their ability to track his movements. Driven by instinct, Chandra steered towards the Shenandoah National Park, a decision that would lead them to a scenic overlook near mile marker 35 on Skyline Drive. The family had no connection to this remote location, making Ty's presence there all the more baffling. They found Ty in his car, windows locked, engine idling, and music playing, 
but he was unresponsive to their frantic calls. In a moment of desperation, John, Ty's father, pounded on the car windows, hoping to break through to his son. Suddenly, Ty engaged the car in reverse, nearly hitting his father, and sped off into the night. When Chandra and John caught up, they were met with a chilling scene. The car crashed into a wall, the horn blaring, but Ty had vanished into the forest's dark embrace. The search for Ty was a monumental effort involving Shenandoah National Park officials, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, state police, local sheriff's offices, and a myriad of search and rescue organizations. Despite the deployment of 68 searchers, four dog teams, a helicopter equipped with infrared sensors, the rugged terrain provided a formidable obstacle. Two days into the search, a trail of Ty's belongings was discovered, laid out as if marking a path. His hoodie, pajama pants, and sneakers culminating with his cell phone, its screen shattered and battery life exhausted. The placement of his items suggested that he had taken a direct route through the densest part of the forest. On April 25th, park rangers announced the grim discovery of remains believed to be ties. They were sent for confirmation to the medical examiner in Manassas, Virginia. The cause of death was reported as hypothermia and blunt force injuries. The mystery of Ty's hallucinations and erratic behavior remains unsolved. The family suspects an acne medication Ty was taking, which came with a warning of potential severe mental side effects, could be a contributing factor. However, providing a casual link between the medication and his mental state would be a complex and perhaps impossible legal challenge. The tragedy of Ty Sawyer's disappearance and subsequent death is a reminder of the fragility of the human psyche and the urgent need for mental health awareness and intervention. It's a narrative that leaves a family grappling with an immeasurable loss and a community searching for understanding amidst the silent, towering trees of the Shenandoah. In the spring of 1968, the city of Madison, Wisconsin was the unsuspecting stage for a perplexing disappearance that would baffle the community and challenge the authorities for generations. Michael Larson, a 19-year-old with a promising future, was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison known for his academic prowess and quiet demeanor. His life was devoid of the turmoil that often accompanies youth. He was not entangled in a romantic drama, family disputes, or any known feuds. Moreover, he was not burdened by the prospect of military service during a tumultuous era in American history. His disposition was generally cheerful, and his behavior, up until his disappearance, gave no cause for alarm. Michael resided in the university dormitories, but he had been spending the Easter break at his family's home, a period of reprieve before the rigors of academic life resumed. As the break drew to a close, Michael mentioned to his mother that he intended to step out briefly to get a haircut, a routine errand that would soon spiral into a haunting mystery. His mother, accustomed to the independence and responsibility her son had always shown, thought little of it. However, two days later, she would receive a distressing phone call from the police that would mark the beginning of an enduring enigma. What Michael's mother did not know was that Michael's departure was not as innocuous as it seemed. Before leaving, he withdrew a substantial sum of $650 from his bank account, nearly depleting it. It was a significant amount of money at the time, equivalent to thousands in today's currency, and it suggested premeditation. Along with the cash, Michael took with him a poncho, suitable for inclement weather, and a map of the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. The park, known for its rugged terrain and expansive forests, was a considerable distance from Madison. It was not a place one would venture without a reason. The first tangible clue in Michael's disappearance came when conservation officers in Michigan discovered an abandoned green 1962 Volkswagen sedan. The car was found on a remote back road near a gravel pit in the Porcupine Mountains, a location that seemed to corroborate the map that Michael had taken. The vehicle was unlocked, the keys were in the ignition, and the gas tank was full. This suggested a hasty or unplanned departure from the car. 
The absence of a Wisconsin license plate was peculiar, and the traces of blood found around the front seat added a layer of concern to the already mystifying scene. The blood led to speculation that whomever removed the plate might have sustained a minor injury in the process, yet the driver, presumed to be Michael, was nowhere to be found, and there were no discernible clues pointing to his direction or fate. The investigation was hampered by the lack of a vehicle identification number or VIN a feature that would become mandatory for passenger vehicles only a year later. Investigators had to resort to unconventional methods, such as examining oil change stickers to trace the car's ownership back to Michael Larson. When officers first attempted to contact Michael, they inadvertently reached out to another Michael Larson, an officer at the Madison Police Department. This coincidence initially led to confusion, but eventually helped to connect the dots when the police officer learned of a missing college student by the same name. The search for Michael Larson, the student, was promptly initiated. Michael was no stranger to the wilderness. He was an experienced hiker and backpacker with a keen interest in science. He had previously embarked on a backpacking trip with his younger brother, Tom, to the Porcupine Mountains, the very park where he had now seemingly vanished. Although not an expert in bushcraft, Michael was competent in basic outdoor survival skills and had a familiarity with the park's terrain. The initial searches were fruitless, and the fear that Michael might have fallen into one of the numerous mine shafts in the area loomed large. Despite the mobilization of extensive search efforts, the results were inconclusive. The sheriff's office eventually sent a disheartening letter to Michael's parents, indicating that the search was being called off due to lack of leads. The arrival of deer hunting season, however, brought a renewed vigor to the search. Hunters were implored to remain vigilant of any signs of Michael, and information about his disappearance was broadcast across local radio stations. It was during this time that a hunter from Detroit stumbled upon a chilling scene near the Lake Superior shoreline. A boot with a bone protruding from it. This discovery led to unearthing of a second boot in a similar state, both showing signs of a bear attack. The timing of Michael's disappearance in April coincided with the period where bears emerged from hibernation, often hungry and potentially aggressive, making a bear encounter a plausible explanation for the state of the boots. Several months later, in the frigid grasp of February of 1969, Hunters chanced upon an abandoned campsite deep within the Porcupine Mountains. The campsite, complete with a tent, a canoe, and food suspended from the trees to deter wildlife, immediately became a focal point of speculation. Could this campsite be linked to Michael's disappearance? The mystery only deepened when in October of that year, John Courser from Lando Lakes, Wisconsin, claimed the campsite was his own. Courser's delayed claim and inability to explain the reason for his tardiness in doing so raised eyebrows, especially since Michael had previously worked at a youth camp near Lando Lakes. This raised the possibility that Michael and Courser might have known each other. In a quest for answers, Tom Larson, Michael's brother, reached out to the now elderly Courser in 2022. Courser, at 90 years old, claimed he had no memory of why he delayed claiming the campsite or of meeting Michael Larson. The case took another turn when efforts to revisit it with modern DNA forensic were stymied by the mysterious disappearance of the boots and bones previously found. These crucial pieces of evidence, along with their records, had inexplicably vanished, leaving the case at a standstill. The enduring mystery of Michael Larson's disappearance remains unsolved to this day. His father, Glenn, clung to hope until his last days, interpreting every missed call or abrupt hang-up as a potential sign from Michael. Michael remains the only person to have gone missing in that park, and the search for answers continues. Tom Larson has provided a DNA sample to aid in the investigation, and cadaver dogs have been deployed once more. Hunters are still encouraged to look for any evidence that might shed light on the fate of Michael Larson. Anyone with information on the disappearance of Michael Larson is urged to contact Michael Knack, 
park manager, or John Pepin, a writer at the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. The hope for closure, or perhaps a revelation, persists as the mystery of Michael Larson continues to echo through the Porcupine Mountain Wilderness State Park, a beautiful yet unforgiving landscape that holds within it a story yet to be fully told. If you've enjoyed this content from a universe of mystery, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my new and upcoming content.